Hey, I would like to start. Thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Till Maas and I'm in the, uh, in the image. <laughs> uh, I will go here. Um, I'm here to talk to you about security threats at conferences. And I'm very excited and happy to be invited here. It's my first time in the United States and I like it very much. I'm from... No. Uh, where's the deck? Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, yes, uh, I'm from Aachen, Germany. It's a town uh, located near the Dutch and Belgian borders in Europe. You see where it is. And I'm here today because I joined the Fedora project about 10 years ago. Initially, I started as a packager, but I also contributed patches to several applications that we use at Fedora. Whenever I found something that bugged me, I tried <laughs> to submit a patch. And recently, I'm doing mostly release engineering. Um, and while I'm contributing to Fedora, mostly in my free time, in my day job, I work as a penetration tester at Red Team Pentesting. It's a company specialized uh, on penetration tests, so all day long I try to find security vulnerabilities in our customer systems, and then I document them and present them to our customers. And because I do this all day long, I get a certain feeling for security problems. And now I'm here to present you some that I identified, identified especially at conferences. But I do not uh, want to only um, point to problems. I also want to discuss some countermeasures <laughs> as good as possible. There are some that you can do as a user, but it's also important that projects provide secure access to their services and um, perform certain configurations to make it possible for users to actually be secure. And what kind of threats am I talking about? There's one that I'm currently exposed to because I use this wireless presenter and this should actually only allow me to switch to the next slide, but it's a full keyboard. Not on this side, but on the receiver side. So therefore you can build a custom transmitter and then send arbitrary commands to it because unfortunately the communication is not properly secured. And I hope that you don't do this, because <laughs> wow. this would, for example, delete all my files. It wouldn't work here because I use a dedicated user account, but this is one thread that's here, at least for speakers. For all of us, even if we are not um, giving a talk, there is a thread that comes from other, um, from a more common wireless communication that we're using here, and this is the hotel network or the hotel wireless network. Mm -hmm. And I wonder who of you is using it? <laughs> really? <laughs> Only so, not so many. And do you know whether you are right now using this little access point? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this is the problem. You might not, you do not know if you're really using the access point that I bought or if you're using the actual infrastructure from the hotel. And therefore, certain attacks are possible. Because I can, if you use this access point, I can control all the communication. And this allows for so-called men-in-the-middle attacks. And one basic attack is just to disturb the communication. So I can either make you not communicate at all or just um, prevent you from using certain sites. And what's more dangerous, I can manipulate the communication in a way that you don't know what you're really accessing. For example, even if you open a certain web page, it might be that I manipulated it under the hood and it's doing malicious things. To know whether or not you're using the right website, it's important that you use strong cryptography. And it's basically keys and signatures and with the keys you can encrypt and create signatures and the signatures can be used to verify whether or not you're using the right or whether or not you're accessing the right system and the common protocol for this is HTTPS compared to plain HTTP which doesn't use encryption I don't want to get into more details about cryptography but there will be um, a presentation tomorrow at 11 a.m. that might be interesting for you if you want to know the basics of it 
But there's also another important detail about wireless attacks, and it's not even necessary that, uh, necessary that they use the wireless network that's available here, but if your devices are configured to use any free wireless network, for example from the airport or from some cafe at home, it's uh, still possible for me to create the access point properly here, and then your devices would connect to it. And I wonder, is any one of you using WPA Enterprise at your company? And uh, you will also have a problem because it's very hard with Linux and Android to use it securely. It's, um, it's possible if you um, really properly configure your devices, but it's not very easy. And if you're using, for example, username and password authentication with WPA Enterprise, it might be possible that I create just the access point that you use at your company, and your devices will also tell me what, the, what are the names of the networks that they, are, that they know, and then I might get your username and password, and it would be maybe even possible to access other uh, accounts or services from your company if you use the same accounts there. Uh, if you are interested in the, into the details, you can grab me after the talk and we can discuss whether or not you're really affected by this. And um, for everyone else, it's probably um, sometimes more common to use, um, oh, let me begin again. If you already know that there might be attacks uh, at the Wi-Fi network, you might be using a VPN to protect yourself from these local attacks. But VPN is not really created to protect against these attacks but allow you to access your home systems and therefore there are still some problems that might be arise from just using a VPN for protection. For example, there are many conferences for, uh, like for example FOSDEM in Brussels that already provide IPv6 access but it's not so common to have IPv6 access or IPv6 networks everywhere so VPNs might not even handle it but they are used to access your home system. If you don't have IPv6 at home, uh, the VPN might not be IPv6 aware. And then, if your system, like Linux does for a long time, supports IPv6, and the local network supports IPv6, all your traffic might actually be bypassed and bypassing the VPN and not using, not be protected by the VPN. And additionally, an attacker can also create, uh, provide you with IPv6 connectivity, making sure that your VPN is bypassed. And another problem, uh, which should not be forgotten, is DNS. Even if all your regular traffic is protected via the VPN, it might still be possible that you do not use your local DNS server. Sometimes there are even setups at conferences where you want to use the local DNS set up to access local services and then this can still be used by an attacker to make sure that certain traffic is not routed uh, through the VPN. And therefore you also need additionally a firewall which makes it a rather complex construct. It's not just enable the VPN and everything is working but there are several other things like I said that need to be um, considered. And rather easy and good workaround if, um, for the meantime, if you just want to have a VPN but don't have one, would be to use SSH. It can be used to support, to create a so-called SOX proxy server. You need the dash uppercase D parameter and then uh, you can configure your browser, for example Firefox, to use the SOX server and then all your local traffic is at least secured at this point. And if you have a uh, software that does not support SOX directly, there are other, tool, other tools like proxy chains G or TSOX available that you can use to create, to, um, to make them SOX aware. But there, uh, this still leaves certain problems. For example, you are then secured at the conference, but depending on where your SSH server or VPN endpoint is located, the traffic between the VPN endpoint and the other service is still not protected. So it's not really a final solution. And also, as an attacker, I can just make sure that all traffic through your VPN is very slow. And if you're, for example, from Europe, you might just think it's because um, 
the traffic from the USA to Europe is currently not so good from this conference and might not be using the VPN without really thinking that an attacker is currently performing an attack. And of course this is also something where you have to consider um, who is really responsible to, be, uh, to allow to access a service securely. Is it the user who has to make sure that uh, everything is protected but he can't or he or she can't really because it's not possible to have a VPN to the final service or is it the service provider that has to do something? And also um, if, it's, if your VPN is not working, would you really stop accessing it? And especially at the conference, they have a workshop and you would like to uh, attend and configure something. I guess many people will just try to access the internet and not think about attackers. And last but not least, there's also at least one page that you will be accessing without the VPN. And this is the login page for the wireless network because you can't access it um, because you can't access your VPN before you exit this login page there will be at least one request that's not secured and there are even attacks possible right now um, so the VPN is not the final solution and the problem is that in for the World Wide Web we use cookies and cookies um, are especially used to store a secret value and this secret value is used to identify yourself to web pages and this allows you to access web pages without having to enter your username and password again and again and again but it also means that the value of this cookie is as important as a password because once an attacker gets it then um, then the attacker can access the service with the same privileges as the original user. And how can I do with this as an attacker? If you're browsing any unprotected web page, it's possible to insert content that doesn't belong there. So for example, an image, in this case it would be an image from the block scheduling web application that also supports authentication. As you can see, it's insecurely using H plain HTTP instead of HTTPS. And if the browser has a cookie for this service and it's not well protected, it will be sent via the unencrypted connection and then the attacker can read it and use the scheduling application, in this case, with the same um, privileges. But it's actually rather easy to make sure that this doesn't happen all you need to say is secure. I don't know if you can see it. There's, it's uh, highlighted in red. Um, if you set a cookie, you just say secure and then the browser knows this is an important cookie and won't send it over unencrypted connections. This is something I believe that's uh, in the RFC for cookies since the beginning. So several years, uh, more than 20 years ago or something like this. But there are still modern um, frameworks that don't do this by default. Um, I gave the similar talk uh, at DEF CONF earlier this year and uh, when I looked into this for uh, into a good example from the Fedora infrastructure I noticed that uh, there are the new applications didn't do it right because the new framework didn't do it by default and nobody looked into it until then. Now the question remains why does the flux scheduling service not do it right? And if you, um, does anyone notice what's wrong here? HTTP. Yes, uh, it's plain HTTP and not HTTPS, and this is currently the default. So, did anyone notice it uh, while logging in earlier? Yeah, so here it's basically already the problem that <laughs> if you log in into this web application at this point, your username and password will be sent unencrypted through the wireless network. So it's even easier to get to the credential. But this is also the reason why they can't protect the cookie. Because if the cookie would only be sent via secure communication or HTTPS, it, you would have to log in uh, again and again because the uh, service didn't know that you're already authenticated. And why don't they do this? Because HTTPS actually works. I asked them and they told me that the problem is that um, they provide their service also for their customers to integrate them into their application. 
and then they said it uh, doesn't work always. I'm not so sure if it's really a valid re reason, but at least for the Fedora web application, it's also currently the case that the um, certificate is not um, correct. So there you could log in as, as well, but it's not possible to do it um, via HTTPS. Fortunately, it's really a rare example that we have a web page in Fedora which doesn't have proper certificates. Um, I just want to use it as an example in this case. And therefore, it's important uh, to use proper certificates and provide proper HTTPS service. And if you buy a certificate, it's also not that expensive anymore. It's about $10 per year per certificate. And hopefully next month, it will also be possible to easily get secure and free certificates. But just providing HTTPS service, not enough, because initially HTTPS was not designed with security in mind. Um, there were secret agencies that influenced the creation of the protocol to make it secure, insecure by default, so they could, could still break it. And in the um, and recently, there were several publications about the problems that were found in earlier versions of the Sander. So it's also important that you check your configuration and make it right and only um, enable recent and proper um, cipher suites, for example, and protocol versions. There's, there are so many details about this that I can also not explain right now. But if you, for example, use this web page, and don't have the proper configured server, you also find a lot, um, you find help about what you have to do. And I will now show um, an attack that might also happen if you provide HTTPS and it's also secu uh, configured securely, because it's still possible as an attacker to make sure that you're not accessing the web, ser web service via HTTPS, because um, by default, if you enter um, an address in your browser, it will default to plain HTTP and not HTTPS. And if, uh, as an attacker, I block all HTTPS access, I can make sure that the user connects via plain HTTP. And even if the um, server and the um, if the service server does not um, does support HTTPS, I can make sure that a proxy program connects via HTTPS to the service, but only provides, provides plain HTTP to the, um, to the user. And to reduce this risk, to make sure that users don't always have to check whether or not they are using plain HTTP or HTTPS, there was, an, um, there was something added to HTTP, a header called strict transport security. And if you use this, it makes sure that every request to a certain domain is only made securely via HTTPS. By default, it's for, you, have also, um, you have to set a certain time, so once your browser connected to a web page securely, it will connect to it for, for example, the next half a year. And this still leaves a small window of opportunity, because um, if you access a service for the first time, your browser does not still know does not yet know that you have to access it um, via HTTPS. And therefore, there's a so-called preload uh, list that is maintained by the Chrome developers. And there you can add your domain after you configured it correctly. And then it will eventually be shipped with, the, with uh, all major browsers. And then the browsers know this is a domain that should only be accessed securely. Of course, it takes a little time until it's available everywhere. but um, this makes really sure that um, the user does not have to, um, does not, let me begin again. This makes sure that the user does not um, have any problems if a web page accidentally uses HTTP or if there's an attacker that wants to make sure that HTTP is used. And in Fedora, we cannot still uh, use it for all of fedoraproject.org, but um, only for selected subpages, because we, we have still uh, two or three services that we need to migrate to a proper CA, but hopefully this will also happen soon. 
Um, until now, I mainly discussed HTTP and HTTPS, but there are also other protocols that are commonly used at conferences, and not everyone might be aware that they are not that secure. For example, if you use Git like this with the native protocol, you don't have any um, cryptogra cryptographic protection. So if you use this in my attacker Wi-Fi network, I could use it to insert arbitrary contents into the Git repository that you're cloning. So it's, of course, it's not on the server side, but on the local side. Um, but later, if you, for example, push your code again back to, um, to the uh, server repository, it might also um, get there. Therefore, you should only use secure protocols like HTTPS again, or um, SSH if you need to byte access. It's also important to not do, uh, for example, use the Git protocol at home because you feel it's safe there. Because, um, because then you have the problem if you do it again at a conference, you might not change the protocol and still be using the insecure method. At Fedora, we already promote this secure protocol at certain pages, especially, for example, at Fedora Hosted and the no new Git uh, font and pager will also only provide the secure access. And this, again, makes sure that users uh, do not use insecure configuration by default, but only secure configuration. And the HTTPS protocol also supports a so-called smart transport, which is basically a CGI script in the back end. And this makes sure that you don't have um, huge performance penalties that were um, that existed when Git was initially introduced, or the HTTP um, transport method was introduced. But this also leads to the next problem: if you ever used SSH to access a certain um, Git repository, you probably saw this error message. And this again, um, this indicates that your uh, the SSH tool doesn't know whether or not it's talking to the right servers. So if you're at a conference, it might also be possible that you are actu actually accessing a service, um, or the, the server from an attacker. At Fedora, um, we therefore provide you with secure access to all the SSH keys that are needed to identify the proper service. And you can, for example, easily download them and store them in your local system, and then uh, you won't be asked whether or not it's the right server, but only gets warned if it's the wrong server. And this is something that would, I would like to recommend for other services as well, because it makes it really easy to do it securely by default. And it's not only HTTP, uh, not only SSH, it's everything that we provide in Fedora that's properly signed. And you find, whenever you download something, you find uh, instructions how to verify everything that we um, submitted. This is something uh, that's also important. Whenever you provide access to something, make su sure that it's properly, it can be properly verified. In this case, we use uh, GPG. With GPG, it's important to verify the keys again that you have there. And many people only use the so-called key ID, which is a small part of the fingerprint, but this uh, key ID can easily be forged. So you can create a, a second key which, use, which has the same key ID, and therefore you have to you, you have to verify the whole fingerprint. Or in this case, it's also possible to download the key directly from uh, Fedora over the HTTPS protocol. And um, I believe earlier this year, someone even showed how easy it is to fake all these uh, short key IDs, and they uh, cloned every publicly available GPG key and created a second one with the same key ID and they also added all the signatures that they found earlier. So if you look at their key server, it all looks uh, like the regular keys, but they are all keys that they get generated. This uh, shows again that there's, um, it's uh, practical, poss practically possible to do this kind of attack. And uh, the other part in Fedora, we are not only providing users with software, we are also consuming it in, um, in the form of 
um, source code get, that you get from upstream um, projects. And when you're lucky, they also provide uh, signatures, for example, here for YouTube DL. And therefore, it's also possible, uh, therefore, it's also necessary to, to check these um, signatures whenever they are available to make sure that we are not distributing any um, modified content to our users. And this is, for example, how it can be easy done. You specify the source, the signature, and the key in a spec file, and then make sure before you do anything here in the uh, spec file that you verify whether or not the source, the key, and the signatures match. And only if this succeeds, then you do anything with the source code. So, until now, um, I only talked about a technical risk, especially for your passwords, but there are also some other problems at the conference. If you want to collaborate, you probably uh, need to access a lot of services, and therefore you will enter your passwords a lot. And with other people around you, it might be easy that someone just notice or can just see which kind of password you're entering, or what's the password you're entering. Therefore, it's also good to avoid password to avoid using passwords as a single mean of authentication. There are several devices currently available that, um, that you can use additionally to a password, and at Fedora, we support uh, so-called UI keys um, for at, the, at least currently for critical access, for um, administrative access, in Fedora infrastructure. I know that there are plans to provide this kind of protection for future, in the future for other services as well and for regular services. And this um, is more or less the only protection that you have to protect your password from being spotted at a conference. And um, here we have also another example that we not only provide this kind of security, at least for administrative access, we also promote it by um, giving people at least a Fedora badge whenever they configure uh, UV keys. And there's, um, there's even uh, another web page that I want to show you that um, wants to promote secure uh, two-factor authentication, but on, from the other point of view, because they list all services or service providers that already provide secure access. And whenever you're providing service, it should be um, a motivation for you to be added to this list to um, have an advantage compared to other uh, service providers. And this is more or less all I wanted to talk to you about currently. Um, in conclusion, I want to make sure that whenever you access something, you try to use encryption, or not even try it, you enforce it. And this is something that needs to be done, especially as a project, to protect the users. And also, um, encryption does not protect you against everything. You also need to make sure that whenever you consume something, it's the right one. Therefore, um, verify everything and allow others to verify what you've done by signing it. And if possible, try to avoid passwords, at least in the long term, try uh, to get rid of them. So I also uh, got my badge now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and yeah, I also would like everyone who provided me with an image uh, for this presentation. Here you find the sources. And uh, if you ever want to consume something that I signed, here are, my, here are the details about my um, DVG key. But there will also be a key signing party um, on Friday. I believe 5 p.m. So, are there any questions? Okay, so um, I, I'm not very knowledgeable about uh, a lot of this stuff. And at work, um, I like how to watch all these videos, and it says that they said to do all the same things that you did. I said, I don't actually know how to go about doing any of those things. Like, I know the words, like, I've heard them before, and I just listened to your presentation, but I still don't know what to do. Like, I logged into my work email, which I'm sure I was not supposed to on this very insecure network. So, yeah. <laughs> How do I actually, uh, like, what's the next step to actually doing these things? Is it, like, so, straightforward? It, it, so the uh, easiest thing for you to protect, you would be if you have, uh, do you know SSH? Or I mean, I don't know of it. I've heard okay. the word. So, okay. <laughs> so this, 
if someone, uh, if you know someone who's providing you with an SSH server, you can probably easily use it to at least protect you against local attackers. Um, and the other thing is that um, actually your um, employer needs to make sure that you can access your web service uh, securely. So it's something you can, uh, can check whether or not you're using HTTPS, but uh, it doesn't show you whether or not the cookies is, uh, are really protected. So it's vigilance. Yeah. <laughs> so I have yeah, really uh, easy first steps as a user. I think it's only the only thing is would be using at least uh, some kind of protection like an SSH uh, server on VPN. Yeah. So I, I was on the Southwest at this point. I was on the Southwest Airlines and they have uh, in-flight Wi-Fi. Um, so I ha had two browsers, one is Firefox, one is um, Chrome. On my Chrome I disabled my HTTPS everywhere, that's an ex extension. All of a sudden I started notic noticing this bar on top of my web pages that showed the flight status. So Southwest started injecting their own scripts inside web pages and started to show this bar. And then when I turned back to my Firefox where I had HTTPS everywhere, it didn't appear anymore because they cannot really inject anything into HTTPS. Yeah. So it uh, comes down to <laughs> um, looking out <laughs> when you are in the... Yeah, I actually had a similar interesting experience with like Wi-Fi. Um, I, I tried to connect to a Wi-Fi server and I didn't have the connection to Wi-Fi. I think it was in Chrome. And uh, Chrome went, it looks like you're being man in the middle. I refuse to permit you to connect to this. And I went, oh, well, that's good that it's refusing to permit me to connect. Kind of annoying, but, you know. Yeah. It, this is also... You have to watch out. This is also something that you get as um, a service provider. If you use the HSTS header, then the uh, border will, make, uh, will not allow you to bypass these kind of warnings. But it will only sh show you, oh, there's something wrong. You might be attacked. Bad luck. I mean, I, I think the HTTPS everywhere uh, extension is a good one to mention in this presentation because it's kind of always forces uh, to use HTTPS. Um. Yeah, so maybe it would be something for you. There's an extension for a browser that more or less um, changes the HTTPS um, setting with HSTS to the browser that so that your browser um, remembers whether or not you can access something via HTTPS if it ever worked. What's your opinion on SSH fingerprints in DNS records? If you're using a DNS sec, it's obviously a good idea and, and when you verify it, but um, on its own it does not add much protection because when you're using a DNS server um, servers unprotected, an attacker can also manipulate it. Correct. So. Would you be in beta report if DNSSEC was widely adopted? Yes. Great. I think uh, Fedora also provides even secure, uh, DNSSEC secured uh, access to SSH fingerprints um, right now. But the problem still is that uh, the clients don't check it properly yeah, yet. I mean, all, all the big gate hosters have records out there, but they don't get verified properly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, then, thank you very much. If you have uh, any more questions later, you can also grab me at the conference uh, anytime. <laughs>